from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Brown. I'm a music specialist here at the Library of Congress. I work in the music division as a concert producer for our series that takes place over in the Coolidge Auditorium. Uh, nice to see many friendly and familiar faces, and also nice to see so many new faces to our lecture series here in the music division. Uh, the talk today is going to be on boy bands in the Library of Congress, which is a topic that probably hasn't been covered so much in uh, public events here, but I think it should be covered more. Uh, the title is Hair Gel and Groupies, which has nothing to do with anything aside from their somewhat related topics to uh, boy band culture in terms of there's a lot of hair gel going on with the, the musicians, as you'll see in some of the photos, and uh, young tween groupies were also a thing and continue to be a thing with boy band culture. So just a bit about the format of what we're going to do today. I'm going to kind of introduce a, a, a thesis statement for you to ponder. Uh, and then my goal is to kind of introduce you to some of the different types of materials that we have relative to boy bands. Uh, also introduce two different kind of broad definitions of what a boy band might be. And then hopefully have some fun. And there's going to be a lot of listening and viewing to be done. For those that are watching this webcast at some date in the future, uh, Unfortunately, the videos are under copyright, so I'm not going to be able to include them in the webcast version of this. However, everything is on YouTube, which is where I pulled them from. Uh, and actually, most of them are up there legally, which is kind of cool. So if you can just go on YouTube and search for the artist's name and the title, and you'll find the appropriate video. OK, so there are kind of two directions that we can go in with definitions for boy bands. Um, <laughs> oh, it gets better. What? Oh, geez, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, James Wintle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anywho, so there are uh, two avenues in which we can define uh, uh, boy bands. The first sort of more commonly used is uh, referring to pop group, male pop groups from the 90s and into the 21st century that particularly appeal to uh, young teen women. Uh, which is uh, a market segment, of course. And a broader definition of it actually will go back and, and retroactively apply boy bands as a term to things, to uh, entities like the Beatles or a lot of the Motown bands are in groups like uh, the Temptations, the Four Tops. Uh, and specifically with the 90s groups, we see a, a lineage that goes back to Jackson 5, of course, uh, and some other folks that we'll see in here. Uh, there is an official. Library of Congress subject heading for boy bands, which is really awesome. And uh, there is also a Grove Music Online article about boy bands, which means it's so conservative and mainstream that it's in Grove. Um, so, Also, the Oxford Dictionaries have it uh, listed as, quote, a pop group composed of attractive young men whose music <laughs> and image are designed to appeal primarily to a young teenage audience. And there you can see the, uh, the record for the Library of Congress subject heading online. And then this is the visualization of the subject heading. So you can see a broader uh, scope would be vocal groups. Um, I do want to mention that I am mainly a classical music guy. Uh, but I grew up listening to all this 90s boy band pop stuff, even though I was not a teenage girl. Um, <laughs> so what that says about the stereotype, I don't know. Um, since the Library of Congress uh, started accepting copyrights in the 19th century, well, it, in the 19th century, and we also had some going back earlier than that, uh, the institution has been a repository for American and global cultural memory. Um, and whether or not we like it, boy band culture is a part of history. And uh, there's a lot of folks in mainstream musicological circles who think there is no merit in studying popular music culture, and that is nonsense, if you ask me, and they need to broaden their horizons a little bit. It uh, doesn't mean that they need to study pop music, but someone should. And therefore, it is the Library of Congress's duty to collect and preserve items relevant to important trends in history, particularly American history. Uh, so there is a, a very important dependence on uh, places like the Library of Congress as a repository institution, and also comparable institutions like the Grammy Museum, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, also various uh, centers for popular music and popular culture studies that exist at various universities. Um, all of these folks are working to 
make content available to those that want to study it, which is great. Here's that Oxford Music Online article. It's under copyright, so I just gave you a little snippet. Um, and it is by a guy named Craig Genex, who also wrote the entries for most of the boy bands who are actually listed in Oxford Music Online, which is cool. And uh, his article is uh, quite entertaining. I'll give you a little excerpt here. So there are several different key ingredients to the boy band concept, right? So there is some kind of sex appeal for young women um, and uh, also young men. And uh, there is um, a certain kind of conflict because these boy bands are appealing to teenage girls who are not 18. So there has to be a very PG rated of appeal going on, which is tricky and I'm sure someone can study that. There's also certain uh, involvement with dance, as you can see with Backstreet Boys or NSYNC uh, music videos and the dance that went into the productions has, has a huge role and is probably more impressive or more entertaining than the music in many cases. So going back to Craig Jennings's uh, description here, I'll share a quote with you, which is kind of fun. So, quote, despite the frequent use of subtle sexual euphemisms, they typically emphasize the emotional connection over physical, making the genre culturally appropriate for adolescent participation. They presented their lyrics through uncomplicated harmonies, which is probably the most positive way that's ever been described, and, <laughs> and accessible song structures, end quote. So he kind of puts forth, forth this structure and this model for boy bands, which I think we can go back and apply to any of the bands we're gonna talk about today, in that the boy bands were representative of the different archetypes in sort of young man, young male culture. So there's the jock, he also uses clown, the rebel, the heartthrob, and the hot mess, pretty much. But I, um, I added that one in. You can see in, uh, I think it's Backstreet Boys, the guy with dreads, it's not, not a good thing. Um, so why do we collect and preserve these materials? I gave a, a bit of an intro, um, but for anyone who likes to criticize my interest in this, I point you to the mission of the Library of Congress, which says the library's central mission is to provide Congress and then the federal government and the American people with a rich, diverse, and enduring source of knowledge that can be relied upon to inform, inspire, and engage them and support their intellectual and creative endeavors. And this is the cover of the new strategic plan for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. There's some other um, bits within the strategic plan that kind of give us the justification for doing this work, including, quote, the Library of Congress is a chief steward of America's and the world's record of knowledge and is a springboard to the future while providing indispensable services to Congress, end quote. Now, Congress probably isn't gonna come borrow a One Direction book, but some of you staffers might. Um, and there is certainly an, a need to have an understanding of performing arts copyright things like recordings and uh, sheet music and such, and these materials can serve as a, uh, a resource for that, especially in terms of figuring out who owns what, and uh, there are some lawsuits going on, which we'll talk about in a little while. Uh, there are some values that are, are pointed out in the strategic plan that I'd also like to mention. Uh, excerpts from the values are, to, quote, to leverage the strength of diversity in the library staff collections and constituents. Certainly there is diversity if we bring in pop culture with highbrow intellectual culture, such as art music. Uh, and also in the core functions of the Library of Congress, quote, acquire, describe, make accessible, secure, and preserve a universal collection of knowledge in physical and electronic formats and obtain electronic access for its own users to digital materials held by other entities. And then a second core function, quote, demonstrate the scope and value of library collection staff expertise and resulting scholarship through a variety of public programs, such as this one, publications and online presentations. Uh, so there is a, an important figure who I'd like to mention, and this is probably the first time he's being mentioned in relationship to 90s pop bands, um, Oscar Sonic, who was the second chief of the music division, really instilled this vision of the, the music division's collections being the national performing arts and music uh, s s resource for study. So uh, a shout out to Oscar Sonic. And uh, one thing that was part of his vision was to, quote, create a musical collection worthy of America's National Library, end quote, and also the development of a collection reflecting musical culture. There is no value judgment placed in that statement. So ponder that. Um, there are some other reasons why I think 
boy bands are worthy of our uh, attention somewhat. Um, they give a lot of context to major issues happening in history. And as you'll see in some of the materials that we'll look at, you can see um, fashion as it was evolving from the 80s into 90s, which some people argue is in response to um, economic conditions in the US and globally, post Reagan, during Reagan, et cetera. And uh, conflict with um, the Gulf War, for example, if anyone saw the movie In the Army Now, which is also probably the first time this has ever been mentioned at the Library of Congress, um, a lot of the fashion statements made in a film like that are, are reflected in the, the images that you'll see related to the pop bands here. Also, if we look back at uh, larger scale topics like the civil rights movement, uh, there's major roles for music and pop music in those, uh, those topics. And the, uh, boy bands, whether we like it or not, are part of the culture. So let's keep looking at it. So getting a little further into this, there are three main areas where we get our uh, boy band materials from. And this applies to pretty much any other kind of material. So copyright deposits, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, there are also the don donations of materials. And then there's acquisitions of special collections. We'll see in uh, the images today and also in the show and tell that you can see at the end that there are m most of the things you're going to see are copyright deposit materials. Um, but there's also situations of um, boy bands being incorporated into things like public broadcasting news coverage, in which case you can go into the new archive of public broadcasting to get more information and see how the media is covering that. So hey, look at that. It's reception history of boy bands in public news making. So some of the types of materials that we'll uh, address are nonfiction books, sheet music, memorabilia, periodicals and newspapers. Also, I'll add serials to that list, um, audio recordings, and film and TV materials. So I'll, ref I'll kind of explain some of the different materials as we go through here. Uh, this is a shelf in the Music 420s, uh, ML 420s, where there is a whole ton of Beatles books, which I just discovered for the first time, because I generally don't go to that section. But I went there now, and it was great. Um, there's a lot more about the Beatles than a lot of other really important classical composers who we pay much more attention to. Um, so that is certainly a reflection of popular culture creating content uh, related to, to popular music that then outweighs. Um, so there's, there's more attention paid by popular culture than academia, is my point there. And uh, you can see the result of this. And a lot of these books are, uh, there's, it's kind of biographical sketches of them. There's also some uh, strange memorabilia books, uh, like The Beatles Down Under, which is a title here you can see in the orange on the left. Um, and then there's also scholarly publications related to the Beatles. Um, there's the Complete Idiot's Guide to the Beatles. Uh, the Cambridge Companion to the Beatles, which if anyone's a classical music uh, scholar, the Cambridge Companions to composers are really great. The Beatles Encyclopedia. The Beatles 365 Days. This is a, like a good coffee table book of photos. And then uh, we'll get into the Jackson 5 here. So we all know the Jackson 5. Does anyone not know who the Jackson 5 are? OK, cool. So just for the uh, interwebs world, uh, this is where Michael Jackson got his start. It was a boy band uh, formed in 1969 under the auspices of Motown Records. And they were modeled after the Temptations. Uh, this is an example of an item in the collections. This is a video recording uh, that came through copyright deposit of a Soul Train episode that featured the Jackson 5. And we will get to watch it. OK, so that's an example of something that's a video format, right? Um, if we're going to keep in mind the topic of fashion, notice what they were wearing, bell bottoms, really tight. Um, the hairdos were important. Uh, there's also a certain dance style reflected in, in the, the music. And also note how they're very, uh, f at least in that little clip that we saw, focused behind the microphones. They're not running all around. Um, as might have been the case in other uh, videos. This is an item uh, that you can see over here, which is in that M421 world, uh, ML421, sorry. And it is a Michael Jackson scrapbook, so specifically looking at his development in the early years of the Jackson 5. 
some cool photos. And just for you, over 100 never before seen photos of Michael and his family. Does anyone know what this is? Okay. Well, yeah, sheet music. So we have a lot of marching band scores, totally random, but we're the repository for copyright. So uh, we're the place that would have them, aside from a performing arts library uh, that does band music. Uh, what's interesting is uh, if you look at the marching band music, there's a certain level of repertoire that gets into that world. Um, so you'll see here two of the Jackson 5 songs. Um, I'm sure these things exist, but the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC marching band arrangements uh, have yet to be found by me in, in our collections. Um, and that might be a result of the, the, the arrangers just not submitting them, but I can say that somehow there's a greater value to the Jackson 5 artistically than Backstreet Boys, which I don't know that anyone would disagree with. Um, and this to give you another taste of Jackson 5. Cool, so we're seeing changes in costuming even from 1970 to 1971. Um, this is of course not a large enough sample size to determine something definitive. Uh, but you can see there's a lot more dancing going on, at least with uh, Michael Jackson in this case. And uh, the white pants with the Christmas tree is, um, are interesting. Okay, so gonna shift over to the Latin American world now with a uh, pop boy band called Menudo. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I don't think I was born yet when they were a thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so uh, Menudo originally formed in 1977. They were uh, based out of Puerto Rico. And uh, one funny fact about their band was that the singers used to originally get kicked out when they turned eight, 16 uh, because I guess that was the barrier in terms of the PG-ness. Uh, there's a, a funny term used by the uh, writer in Grove Music Online about them called Menudo Mania uh, in terms of the hype around them. Uh, they became more popular in the United States in the 80s and over time there were 30 plus singers on their stage. Not at the same time, but they kind of rotated in and out because of that age limit. So here you see a kind of you know, juvenile memorabilia book from 1984 about them. Uh, one thing that I do have to say about the library's collections with re regard to boy bands is that uh, non-US based boy bands are, are not as represented in our collections. Um, for various reasons, just like all kinds of other topics. Um, in terms of if you go in and look at Menudo compared to Backstreet Boys, there's like 2,000 times more content for Backstreet Boys. And um, the place where there is more of the Latin American boy band music is in the copyright deposits of sound recordings. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of work that we can do in terms of, you know, if we find people who have private collections of uh, Menudo memorabilia, for example, and there's a division at the library that is interested in growing that area of collections, then it, it uh, you know, maybe that's a good thing to look into. But I'm not a manager, so I don't have any say. It's okay. Um, here you can see one of those uh, musical recordings. Interesting thing about RCA Victor, does anyone know the story about Carl Engel and bringing in Victor talking uh, recordings back in the 20s? Does anyone know who Carl Engel was? No music division people can answer. <laughs> so Carl Engel was the third chief of the music division. Uh, he came into office in 1922 and lasted until 1934, in which case he got a more powerful job outside, I guess he saw it that way. He went to become president of G. Shermer. Uh, and when he came into the, the music division, he was all about growing the collections and fulfilling the mission that Sonic had put in place uh, previous to him. Uh, Engel developed a relationship with the Victor Talking Record Company, Victor Talking Machine Company. And uh, he kind of haggled them for two years uh, to get them to donate recordings of commercial releases and other unpublished stuff to the library to develop a sound collection. Um, there was some wax cylinder that existed somewhere before, but in the literature that I found, 
it said that uh, Engel's uh, project with the Victor Company was really the beginning of our sound archive in the sense that we know today. Um, so over the course of Engel's tenure, they brought in a, a few thousand recordings. Some of those were selected by Engel and his staff from the RCA or from the Victor catalogs. And later on, as the relationship kind of uh, weakened a bit, uh, the Victor Company was just sending stuff that they thought would be worthwhile for the. Uh, music division's sound collections. And nowadays, there's a whole recorded sound section, as we know, and they have over 3.5 million recordings. So it's kind of cool that uh, former chief of the music division had such an impact over time, starting from a little idea and pestering of a commercial entity. Um, here you can see a little picture of Menudo though, uh, from a record cover in 1982. Note the attire. And if we go back, note the attire here, note the haircuts. The mullet was in fashion, right? <laughs> um, I don't get the see-through quality of this, though. It's kind of weird. Uh, this is a picture of Menudo in New York City, and I thank Carelis for sending it to me today. Um, and it is uh, from the Puerto Rican Digital Library, and this was taken in 1984 at Radio City Music Hall. They look happy. Then here's another picture from uh, about 1977 or 1978. Uh, there are all original Menudo members in this picture, and this is also from the Puerto Rican Digital Library. So now we've arrived at 1990. Menudo, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> So the title of uh, the album and the song is uh, No Me Corten El Pelo, which means don't cut my hair. Um, <laughs> and for anyone that survived this era, um, I think this is, you know, there was a lot of long hair going on with teenage rebellion with boys and, um, yes, and boys wearing headbands and that kind of stuff. Uh, so you can see that all, and there's even the depiction of the scissors with a do not cut symbol there. <laughs> uh, and the, the record from the collection here is of a VHS tape of a performance of this album. Cool. So you can keep watching that on, on YouTube if you'd like. It is not up there legally. Uh, so we are adopting fair use for the in-person portion of this lecture, and then uh, go Google it if you, you want to watch it at home. Uh, there are kind of weird musical strands happening. You could hear some throwbacks to like 50s, early Elvis, rock style. And then we get into much more Latin beat, dance feel going on at this point, um, which one could say speaks to the uh, complicated and close relationship between Puerto Rican culture and American culture, or the differences between those two cultures. Um, and just as a reminder, that's what they used to look like. <laughs> Quite a shock. <laughs> I think there's even eyeliner on the, the guy on the bottom left, anyways. Great, so the next group that I'd like to talk about is called New Edition. Does anyone remember them? Yay! So, funnily enough, they were also from Boston, which is another group, uh, another group we're gonna talk about is from Boston as well. They were established in 1978, uh, and the song we're gonna check out is called Candy Girl, which was one of their top hits. It's also the name of this album here, which was their main debut album. Uh, they were big in the 80s, and some of the other big songs were Can You Stand in the Rain and Cool It Now. And uh, Candy Girl was by a gentleman named Maurice Starr, who also has a role in some of the later bands that we'll discuss. And Candy Girl came out in 1983. Cool. So as you can see, they filmed on location in Boston. The hatch shell was there, and then the John Hancock Tower. And there were no c window panes falling down. Oh well. um, cool. So. The next group that we're gonna talk about is the one you've probably all been waiting for. Um, there they are. New Kids on the Block, later NKOTB, later NKOTB, BSB with Backstreet Boys. Very strange. Um, <laughs> it's I learned a lot, I'm telling you. Um, so they were formed in 1985 by Maurice Starr, who was the guy behind New Edition, and there's Boston Ties there. Uh, the original band uh, had Joey McIntyre, Jordan Knight, 
Jonathan Knight, Danny Wood, Donnie Wahlberg, whom some of you might know from Blue Bloods, which is on TV now, uh, kind of went defunct in 1994, uh, but they came back in 2011 for that uh, CD recording and also the tour with the Backstreet Boys, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and here you see just kind of one of these memorabilia books. This is called The Only Official Autobiography of America's Hottest Group, The Inside Story Told in Their Own Words. And you can see it over here for free. <laughs> so I have a kind of interesting connection to them. Um, it's not anything substantive, but this is a house where the Knights lived, right? Um, on Melville Ave in Boston. It's just uh, the street that runs down the side of the Dorchester District Court. Uh, and I lived there, not in the house, but down the street for like two years when I was a kid growing up. It just actually at the time when they sold it. Um, and their mom sold it to the Salvation Army in 1996. And now it is a sort of uh, multi-purpose community outreach and residential facility. Uh, and apparently there are people that do New Kids on the Block like fan tours in Boston. And there are five sites that they like go around and take pictures at. And they're all middle-aged women who do it. It's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Um, so this is a kind of interesting uh, New Kids on the Block related item. Uh, it is a book, as you can see, uh, and the title is New Kids on the Block, Oral Histories of Immigrant Teens. Um, and it was published by Scholastic, I believe, and you can see it over here, and it's, uh, the idea is to kind of portray their immigrant roots in a positive, happy manner to youth and such. Um, Teenage immigrants from various countries recount the emotional experience of fleeing their homelands and adjusting to a new life in the United States. Um, this is the photo you probably saw on the, the event flyer. This is a uh, juvenile book about New Kids on the Block that came out in 1991. Um, this resides in the ML 3930 world, where you can see stuff from uh, juvenile books about Leonard Bernstein to One Direction, which you'll see over there. And New Kids on the Block and the like. Uh, the Menudo book is also from this uh, section. Uh, Step by Step, one of their big hits. Uh, this is a recording of that by CBS Records in 1990. You can still see Maurice Starr was producing. And uh, now you'll get to hear it. OK. <laughs> Luckily, these songs are so repetitive, you don't need to listen to more than a minute. Um, <laughs> Okay, so to get into periodical and newspaper realm, did you know that there are comic books about boy bands? I didn't know that. I thought it was totally wild. Um, I used to read Calvin and Hobbes and Spider-Man, but apparently New Kids on the Block was a thing to read. And here you can see several comic book records related to New Kids on the Block in the uh, newspaper and current periodical reading room. The titles are Hangin' Tough, Comic Tour, Chillin', Backstage Pass, and just New Kids on the Block. And here you can see uh, Chillin', um, another way of describing these comic books apparently is calling them a digest magazine, because um, they were clearly propaganda items for the band and not about um, making a big creative statement for the comic book industry. Um, this is another example, going back to the film and video uh, collections, uh, an episode of VH1 Behind the Music, which I'm sure some of you used to watch or still watch if it exists still, I don't know. I was more of an MTV guy, sorry. Um, and this was actually from when, uh, from 2008, it was kind of a reunion attempt. Uh, there was a Richie Rich New Kids on the Block comic book. <laughs> and we have it, because no one else does. <laughs> Um, and because the boy bands uh, are commercial successes, generally, if you make it to any of these groups level, um, once they break apart, there's always avenues for uh, reuniting, uh, which happened when Nuka's on the Block and Backstreet Boys uh, did their tour in 2011. Uh, and then also some of the folks go off in their own directions, like Jordan Knight, who 
did a whole remix album of New Kids on the Block songs, um, which we have, because no one else bought it. <laughs> and uh, this is a picture from him performing in the, that tour with the Backstreet Boys. Uh, and there is the official publicity photo for NKOTBSB. And uh, we have that recording. Kind of seems like an attempt to get people who grew up during New Kids on the Block era and their children who grew up in Backstreet Boys era to, <laughs> to listen to the same thing. <laughs> uh, this is an example of uh, so, sort of a, a pop culture book that we have in the Music Division's collections. It's called Boys and the Bands, The Hottest Men in Music from Elvis to NSYNC, Universe and uh, Donald F. Reuter, I guess, was the uh, author. Uh, huh. One of them looks like Marco Rubio. That's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> In the bottom left. Um, so this is an example of kind of literature, even if it's kind of memorabilia, fan books uh, existing to kind of bring this topic together, even though this is a little broader, but it, it, it kind of refers to that uh, sex appeal topic. Uh, Boys to Men, another great boy band. Uh, they are probably one of the more functional uh, reunion type groups. They, they're still touring, and uh, as we all know, hopefully they performed in the Gershon Prize in uh, 2014 with um, Billy Joel. This is again from that juvenile section 3930, and the book is over here for you to see. Note their fashion choices down there, 1997, less overalls, shorter hair, more buttoned up. It looks like they're at an awards show, though, so that might explain it. Cool. And just a funny story, he forgot his cufflinks that night, and he borrowed mine. It's <laughs> kind of a good story. Uh, this is an example of a, a choral octavo score of an arrangement of uh, pop music, a uh, voice to men song, uh, Water Runs Dry, written by Babyface. And it's also available in TTBB and SAB, if anyone's interested in purchasing them. Uh, this is probably one of the better avenues for um, sheet music revenue, I would say, uh, since you know high school choirs all over the country might want to perform current pop songs, and um, there is a market. So of course we would hope these would exist with copyright permission from the original copyright holder. Uh, switching to another Latin group, uh, Chamos, which was a Venezuelan group. Uh, and here is a record for one of their reunion recordings from 2008. Uh, this is a group that probably didn't want to reunite, one, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, um, let's see. This, one, this group was much less influential than Menudo, and uh, they didn't last quite as long, but uh, gives you a sense of you know, things that were trendy um, in other parts of the U.S. and Latin America trickling down to South America as well. It's about all I can handle, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, it's fun. I was having a ball in the office this morning. So this was a song called Siempre Te Amare, which is uh, I'll Always Love You. Now for the reunion video. Um, it's an example of pop stars aging. So anyways, I, I think that was pulled from a like daytime talk show thing, um, which has a certain audience and demographic. Um, did anyone in here buy that reunion CD? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, a little known secret to all of the, the 90s and early 21st century boy band and sort of mainstream pop music is that uh, most of it was written by one guy. And this is him. His name is Max Martin. He was born, to, born in 1971. Um, so he wrote hits for folks like Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Kelly Clarkson, Pink, Katy Perry, Glee, T-Swift, a.k.a. Tay, a.k.a. Taylor Swift, <laughs> who we like because she gives money to classical music organizations. <laughs> Uh, Seattle, Seattle Symphony and then the Nashville Symphony in particular. Um, so some of the uh, specific songs with him include um, I Want It That Way, Oops I Did It Again, You Drive Me Crazy, Hit Me Baby One More Time, um, California Girls, 
he has had, uh, I believe it was tw over 21 number one hits, uh, which has only been topped by Paul McCartney and one other person. And all told, he has about 58 uh, plus songs that made it to the top 10 charts of uh, the Billboard. So um, I think he's making a lot more money than all of these other people if he held on to his copyright. So segue to the Backstreet Boys. Yay. <laughs> this was my favorite boy band when I was growing up. Uh, they were established in 1993, uh, originally in Orlando, Florida. The first round, uh, the original members were Nick Carter, Howie Doro, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry, Brian Littrell, AJ McLean, and Kevin Richardson. Um, they've now sold over 130 million records. Uh, and some folks call them the most successful boy band of all time as a result of that. Um, they have some legal troubles going on with their management, and it's been a problem, I guess, for several years uh, where management wasn't giving them what they thought they were entitled to in terms of uh, performance fees and royalties and that kind of business. Uh, sadly, not uncommon. Um, but so this is an example of you know, not the most valuable intellectual book. Uh, it's, it is a... Backstreet Boys quiz book, uh, which you can glance at over there if you would like. Uh, this is an official Backstreet Boys book from the 421 uh, world. You can see, um, well, Nick Carter's hair didn't change much. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping it had. <laughs> um, and this is a mark record of I Want It That Way. Who knew? Uh, so you can see here that we got uh, this, I think this was a music video. Yes. Um, and came in through copyright. You can see there the copyright classification number and such. And here's the video. <laughs> so my funny story with Backstreet Boys and that song is in sixth grade, we had to do a, a project where we took a pop song and talked about ancient China history and redid the lyrics. So uh, my song was called The China Stomp, and it was uh, set to I Want It That Way. It's kind of funny, anyway. Uh, so this is kind of one of the quirkier little memorabilia books that we have. Um, it's about yay big, and if you look at the table, it's actually standing up. It's the only item standing up. Um, back in the day when we had borders and actual plentiful huge bookstores around, uh, there were all, often those little tiny kitschy books at the checkout counter. Um, so that, that's that kind of concept. We also have the one for NSYNC, don't worry. <laughs> it's kind of like the Schoenberg Stravinsky things, <laughs> NSYNC or Backstreet Boys. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Pick sides. Um, so, and believe it or not, we also have karaoke CDs. Yay! <laughs> Um, so this is the karaoke CD from uh, whoa, 1999 that included Backstreet Boys, I'll Never Break Your Heart. Uh, and sort of if things that are beyond what you would expect, we have things like episodes of Larry King Live in the collections, um, and the Backstreet Boys appeared on Larry King Live, so someone could come up with a paper on that somehow. What's interesting, though, it is a, it's a reunion kind of performance in 2001, so that comes with interesting things. Uh, also, does anyone remember, now that's what I call music, apparently they're up to like 40 plus or 50 plus now, which is insane, but uh, now that's what I call music 2 came out in 1999, and it included uh, Backstreet Boys. And you can see some of the other uh, groups on here, Britney Spears, Sheryl Crow, Fat Boy Slim, Jay-Z, U2, Etc. And for those who don't know these, um, these are kind of compilation CDs of the top hits every so often. And there were uh, many sh ads for these on uh, MTV and VH1 back in the day. Uh, so NSYNC, many of us know them. Here is another quiz book. Very exciting. Uh, so this is, one, this is my favorite item that I found. <laughs> So there's a CD-ROM software slash game called the InSync Hotline, and we have it. Um, and this is a little screenshot from it. And what was interesting about this game is that there was a fantasy phone and game controller which you would plug into your computer so that you could then speak to the members of the band. 
and the software had little responses programmed in, so you could interact with them. Um, yeah, and it's under juvenile software. <laughs> There are fantastic fold-out photos in this book. <laughs> oh, and there are the dreads on the second guy from the left. <laughs> cool. This is just kind of an iconic photo that describes, I think, a lot of people's childhood in the, in the 90s if you were coming of age when uh, InSync and Backstreet Boys were, were big. And this is, of course, no strings attached. You get the joke. Oh, this was also gym pants time. I don't know if these are leather or not, but gym pants were a thing, and people wore them all the time, pre-yoga pants. Um, and the little, uh, the little, if you see the guy on the left, the, the, exte the zipper on the bottom, so you could open up the leg. And just for kicks, bye, bye, bye. Cool. We're nearing the end. Don't worry. OK, uh, here's an example of uh, piano, vocal, guitar, sheet music for Tearing Up My Heart, one of InSync's hits that's in our collections, M1630.2. Uh, this is the One Direction section of a shelf in the 3930s, I think. Um, there's a lot more One Direction than most other boy bands, and I don't know why that is. Maybe they just have a good marketing person. Um, this is this is the the very One Direction book that sparked my whole interest in this topic because I thought it was cool and very out of place in the the rows and rows of classical music shelves. Um, we'll give you a little taste of One Direction. You get it. Um, so interesting things about uh, One Direction: they were originally solo auditionees on the X Factor UK, the TV show, and then Simon Cowell kind of decided that they would make some money if they were singing together. So they re-entered uh, X Factor as an ensemble and placed third place. And then after that point, it was about 2012, is when they exploded uh, in the international scene. And since then, one of the guys has departed, and there's drama. And apparently, he I think today. Um, his new solo thing charted ahead of the One Direction stuff. Anyways. <laughs> so. <laughs> that just appeared in my Facebook feed. I didn't go seeking it out. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, so this is some more of the One Direction goodies that we have. Some more of the fan book. You can see again, hairstyles have changed since the fro era. We're going to skip that one. Cool. So we have arrived at the end. Um, I want to just kind of remind you of some resources if you'd like to get further in, into uh, pop music studies here at the library or boy, boy band studies. Uh, Catalog.lc.gov, our online catalog, is a great place to start. Uh, if you have trouble there, ask a reference specialist in the music division or rec recorded sound section, et cetera. Um, they are your friends. Uh, for example, I learned from one colleague that we don't have much uh, of the pop music copyright deposits because there was a certain point when the legislation changed and recordings were able to be submitted to cover all of the copyright. Um, so for example, with uh, Mr. Martin, uh, who composed all of those songs for Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, et cetera, we only have a handful of his songs of all of those 20-something number ones and 50-something top 10 in terms of sheet music form, uh, but we do have all the recordings, as well, for sure. Um, there is a popular music encyclopedia that we have available in the Music Division's uh, Performing Arts Reading Room, and that is a reference item that you can use in there. This is the entry for New Kids on the Block in that encyclopedia. Um, we also have various pop music uh, serials and journals that address these topics on a, in a scholarly level, uh, or in a scholarly manner. Uh, this is another journal here called Popular Music and Society. Uh, we have billboard magazines, so if you want to see from the horse's mouth who did what at what point in terms of charting, you can check that out. Uh, Seventeen Magazine. We have that in our collections. I didn't know that until I looked this up. Um, but if we're thinking about the way that boy bands are marketed to uh, teenage women and young women, uh, a, a, 
an item like Seventeen Magazine is a source of seeing, you know, what was being done in marketing. So if you're a marketer for, you know, the, the music business, there's some value in that kind of uh, uh, material. These are commemorative covers, so you can collect all of the One Direction <laughs> members. Um, and for the uh, academics who like to hate, uh, the Learned Society for Musicology has a popular music study group, and the purpose of that study group is to um, advocate for popular music research and scholarship and also to raise awareness about the fact that this is a legitimate scholarly pursuit. Um, and I think it's certainly in musicology worlds, um, there are more jobs perhaps coming open for people who are doing things like ethnomusicology and pop music studies than another box specialist because a lot of those box specialists exist and hold on to those jobs until they don't want them anymore. Uh, so a bunch of thank yous. Thanks to the music division for allowing me to do this curator talk. I've really enjoyed putting it together and sharing some kind of quirky bits from our collections with you. Uh, thanks to Sue Vida and Jan Lordson for allowing us to do these. Uh, also, Hispanic Cultural Society and LC Globe for supporting uh, my work and also helping get the word out about this event and all of our curator talks. Also, Carl Engel for kind of changing the culture and bringing in recordings in the 1920s. That's a huge deal, and um, our collections are so rich because of the recordings that, that we have. Um, and also Backstreet Boys just for being fun and entertaining. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.